Coming to you from Floriferous Studio A here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs, it's time for the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. Okay, today's going to be the I'm Ready to Give Up show. No, I'm not ready to give up. You ready to give up? I'm actually not. No, I am less ready to give up than I usually am at this time of year. Very good. So it's not the I'm ready to give up show, but we do have to address the issue. Gardening is not an exact science. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to have some frustrations. And seasoned gardeners are relieved to know that there are others like them that are in the same boat. It was Winston Churchill. You know, Winston Churchill... Many people misquote him. Historians will tell you this. They say, uh, many people will quote Winston Churchill saying, he said, never give up, never give up. The reality is, he said, never give in. Uh Never give in, never, 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 never. As gardeners, we never throw in the trowel. There's always a way to apply common sense and practices where we can deal with some of these frustrations. Now, Looking at a survey, uh, this is interesting. Affecting well over half of gardeners, 55%. So at the top of the list was difficulty in managing insects and pests in the garden. Can you buy that? I can buy that, but I can also buy that, you know, that becomes a lot less daunting when you start to learn about your pests. Sure. You know, when you just see bugs biting holes into things, you freak out. When you see a leaf spot, you just freak out. But then you start to, to dive in, and that's where the magic of gardening happens, right? The more you learn, the less scary these things become. I think that's really smart, uh, Stacy. And as a matter of fact, uh, knowing you, I know your interest in insects. You Very love much. insects. Yes, I do. And getting a education when it comes to insects uh, is important, and it does help. Unpredictable weather came in a close Mm -hmm. second on the list of top gardening frustrations, affecting 46% of gardeners. Of course, Stacey, a lot of talk about climate change. Sure. Well, and there's not much you can do about that. So that is, of all of the things we can control in gardening, the least, you know, the thing that we can have the least control over. But, you know, it it's also where you learn the most. And like when I said that I am less tired than I usually am of gardening, it's because our weather has been, you know, it was really dry, but it's been fairly cool for us here in West Michigan. And apologies to those of you who are sweltering through the heat wave in the rest of the country right now. Um, But, you know, you learn so much when you do encounter these different types of weather events. If everything was just even keeled all the time, you would just think that's the way things are and you'd never learn anything. Yeah, true. 37% of gardeners in this survey found the hobby was easier than expected. 24% found it to be more difficult. Now, one point before we get into the items that we want to deal with, and that is in this survey, and I don't buy this, 73% of respondents agreed that caring for plants required just as much nurturing as looking after a child. No way. Uh Uh-uh. What? From a guy who's had three kids? Uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs> it's a lot Sorry. lower stakes, first of all. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. Exactly. There are some expensive plants out there, but nothing like, you know, a child. Exactly. So, this survey, like any other survey, let's take it with a grain of salt. Here's my list Stacy, deer, weeds, pruning, succulents, hydrangeas, clay soil, moles growing under trees and tree roots, squirrels and chipmunks, time and effort, smaller yields than expected, what to do with it when you have it, it's too hot, and hacks. That's my list of things that cause frustration for gardeners. Those, that's a good list. Those are definitely things that, uh, that cause people to, to be a little bit discouraged right. in their gardening. But you know what? Almost every single thing on there you can actually learn about and then it's no longer discouraged. I mean, weeds, you know, weeds remain an issue. But you could also always take my position, which is just to, like, space your plants closely so there's less room for weeds. Plant <laughs> a lot of wild native plants so the weeds blend in. And, you know, also just be like, you know what? It's okay. If I don't get to the weeds today, I can live with it. Yeah, exactly. And like we've talked about on the show before, apply common sense, a multi-pronged approach Don't get tied up in these hacks that you find on social media. Oh my gosh, please do not. I I think they're getting worse. Oh, they're getting worse. I saw one the other day. They're recommending 
pouring Coca-Cola around your azaleas to get them to bloom and using apple cider vinegar on your hydrangeas to turn them blue. Oh my goodness. Yeah. You know, there's so many things in gardening and I think in life too, right? Where you just assume like, okay, this vinegar is acidic. I know that hydrangeas will turn blue under acidic conditions. Therefore, by giving them vinegar, they will turn blue. But you've missed like a whole huge uh, aspects in there, which is the soil, because the soil is something, you know, there's like a lot of chemical reactions happening. Mm-hmm. It's full of minerals. And so, no, it's not this straightforward line. And people are forgetting that there's this, you know, convoluted chemical path between the two. And so the thing, just because something seems, you know, like it might be right, doesn't mean it, it's, it's, I think they call it the concept of truthiness. Yes, exactly. Truthiness. Good word. I like that. And Stacy, you've taught all of us who watch and listen to the Gardening Simplified show, just don't make assumptions. Don't make right? assumptions. And, just don't do it. You know, there are times where absolutely those hacks uh, might actually work, but also there are usually tried and true products at your garden center that are made specifically, you know, for the purpose, mm-hmm. have instructions so you can apply them properly. Party on the front, business on the back. There you go. And get results, because that's what Mm -hmm. this is about. And I understand everyone's like, well, I have apple cider vinegar. I don't feel like making the trip to the garden center to go buy aluminum sulfate. So, you know, vinegar it is. Um, But, you know, that's still a waste of time and materials. And possibly, depending on what you're doing, it could be polluting something with absolutely no benefit. Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, I get the need to be like, oh, I figured this out. I stuck it to the man. But um, it's not always going (laughs) that straightforward. (laughs) Well, when talking about I'm ready to give up, I would have to probably say deer are tops on the list. Today's word of the day is deer resistible. I made that word up. I like it. That's a good one. Deer resistible. Uh, There are some plants that are just simply deer resistible, like tulips or hostas, where they're just just going to eat them. So uh, to celebrate this show and, and... Encouraging you not to throw in the trowel again. Uh, Can I give you a a limerick? I would love it. Okay, thank you. The deer have done their misdeeds. My veggies produce no proceeds. Beetles just ate my hollyhocks. My plants wilt in the window box. I'm left with just my weeds. The gardenias never stood a chance. A wasp just flew up the leg of my pants. My houseplants are drowning. Even my sunflowers are frowning. My successes are mere happenstance. The bulbs I planted did never appear. The rabbits, the vegetation shear. My pole beans stand askew. My squash has powdery mildew. I am tired of let's wait till next year. So I liberally mulch with manure till the weed growth my flowers obscure. I resent my neighbor's scrutiny. I'm seriously considering mutiny and withdrawing from their garden tour. <laughs> that, was ex- a, that was a good one. An extended limerick. No, no. It's very timely. Thank you. Now, I did want to mention also, I saw on the internet, and we've talked about that, don't believe everything you read on the internet, but this thing about rage gardening. Have you seen that? I have not seen something about rage gardening. Uh, They say instead of venting your frustrations out um, in various ways, do it in the garden, pruning, pulling, digging, slashing, and weeding ferociously. Rage can give you the energy to tear through the tasks you may have neglected. Now, I think that that's ridiculous, too. Gardening is fun. Gardening is fun. I would like to propose a twist on rage gardening and make it rage invasive plant removal. Uh So let's educate people on invasive plants. And when they are in a rage, you know, they've got their training. They can recognize the invasive plants and then they can go into these natural areas and, you know, rage pull some horrible invasive and everyone's the better for it. I like that. I really do. Um... You know, you and I are alike. We we kind of enjoy weeding. I don't mind weeding. Yeah. That's true. So it's not a rage Don't look at my garden, though. <laughs> well, we all get a little behind at this time uh, of the year. So, again, you know, the whole point here, Stacy, is with these various issues that we have where we're ready to give up. And I know you're not going to give up. Neither are we. 
Um, applying common sense and a multi-pronged approach. That's how I've been successful with deer, everything from repellents to deer resistant plants to some barriers. There's a variety of things you employ. Same thing with pest, integrated pest management. Yep. Important. Very important. And you know what? You have to keep an experimental attitude. Exactly. You know, use your brain, but you know, you have to keep trying things. Yeah. And if you do give up, you know what? There's always next year. Here's how it goes, right? Winter, you're, you're ready for spring. Spring comes, you're gung-ho, you're out there, you're working hard. And then, you know, by the time it's getting really hot and you just kind of feel like, you know what, I'm done. And that's okay. Yeah. That's okay to yeah. feel that way. Take a deep breath. But let's be uh, entrepreneurs like Judson uh, taught us a few weeks ago. Risk takers. Risk takers. You got it. Educated Plant risk. And Plants on Trial is coming up next here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified show. It's our Are You Ready to Give Up episode. Yes, it is. And, you know, uh, I do really feel for the people who are going through this heat wave. Uh, I mean, it's the, nothing will make you want to give up on your garden like excessive heat. You can't even be out there. Right. You know, you can't even be out there working, and you can't even be out there enjoying it. So what's the point of working <laughs> if you can't enjoy it? And, you know, honestly, the truth is, if as long as things are, are staying watered, the weeds you can deal with later. Like, yeah. it's, you know, gardening is supposed to be fun, and if it gets to a point where it's not fun for you, it's causing you stress, it's causing you health problems because it's 110 degrees out there, um, it's okay to let it go. Yeah, or be like me out there at 2 o'clock in the morning with a flashlight. Yeah, you can always get a nice nap during the heat of the day. There's Where there's a will, there's a way. A but siesta. you know what? It's You do <laughs> owe yourself a little bit of uh, benevolence as you go through the season Good here. Word. So, uh, But, you know, when it comes to plants on trial, I like to tie it into our topic of the day. And so I picked a plant today for plants on trial that is one that if you give up, it will be, not only will it be okay, it will still look amazing. And while you're in the air conditioning, looking out the window, you'll be patting yourself on the back Ooh. for having chosen this particular plant. I'm already sold and I don't even know what it is. <laughs> well, it's a good one. It is poly petite hibiscus. Have you seen this one before? Nice. Yes. So uh, this is a very interesting hibiscus. And so I'm going to say right off the bat, the two things that are are really distinctive about it and that make it one of those plants that you don't have to worry about when you give up. Uh, number one, it is our smallest hibiscus. So it's a Rosa Sharon. Um, you can think about it like that. It's a hybrid, but ultimately it resembles a Rosa Sharon, but it only reaches about three to five feet tall and wide. And it forms just this cute, tidy little globe shape. So, you know, most Rosa Sharon, they get real tall and they kind of start to fan out. Um, some people even would describe the branches as like a old fashioned caveman club kind of look, sure. you know, where they're all clumpy. Um, clumpy, whereas, <laughs> there's that word again, clumpy. <laughs> I might have used that in regards to a Rosa <laughs> Sharon earlier. Um, but they're nice, it's a nice rounded shape. And this is the least seed set of any hibiscus. Oh, interesting. So, you know, one of the other issues that people, you know, have with hibiscus Absolutely. is that they self-sow. Their yeah. seeds drop and they self-sow everywhere. And, you know, they're pretty easy to tear out, but that is another garden chore that you have to work with. So poly petite is, is all, nearly sterile. So you'll get few, if any, seeds from it. And you're probably thinking, okay, this all sounds pretty great, but what does it look like? And the good news is it looks amazing. Um, I love it for two reasons. Um, it has very, very, very dark green foliage. So much deeper green than your average Rose of Sharon, which can sometimes look a little bit kind of pale. A little anemic. A, a little, little anemic. Pale. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they do have pretty high fertilizer needs, Rose of Sharon in general. And yeah. so if it's not getting the nutrients, it's going to turn kind of like a yellowy color. Poly Petite has a beautiful dark green and all the better to contrast with its lavender flowers. So it's kind of like, um, I mean, it's just like the perfect landscape plant because it's it's giving you all of these blooms and it requires so little. You don't have to worry about it overgrowing its space because it's dwarf. You don't have to worry about it, you know, throwing seeds out all over and, and giving you another maintenance issue. And, you know, it just looks fabulous. And who, even if you're not ready to give up, even if you garden through the heat of the summer, who doesn't want at least a couple plants out there that they yeah. never have to think about and look good without even trying? And it blooms on new wood. It blooms on new wood, right. So um, this is a USDA's own five hardy plant, as okay. are most hardy 
uh, shrub hibiscus. Perennial hibiscus are usually hardy to zone four, but shrub woody plant hibiscus like Rose of Sharon and Polly Petite are hardy to USDA zone five. But yeah, even if it were to get some winter damage, it doesn't set its flower buds until later in the season. So, you know, you can prune it in the spring if you want to. You don't even really need to because it does naturally take on that shape. Uh, so, yeah, it's just a, a really fantastic low maintenance plant. And it comes from a part of the world where you were recently visiting. It comes from uh, Polly Hill Arboretum on Martha's Vineyard out in Massachusetts. Interesting. Yeah. So, I just got back from the Hydrangea Festival on Cape Cod. So that's where it. Yeah. Out, it's from it out that developed. way. Wow. Yeah, and it was a plant that, you know, they developed there and had been growing there for many years. And we were really excited to be able to bring it into the line of Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs and to get it on the market. So, you know, it is one of those plants. I think people love Rosa Sharon, right? There's mm -hmm. People have so much nostalgia and everything for Rosa mm -hmm. Sharon. And then... They see Polly Petite. Of course, they're not blooming normally in the garden center when people are there for, for shopping season because they bloom later. But they see Polly Petite, and it looks so different than what they're yeah. accustomed to seeing with Rosa Sharon yeah. that they kind of might think like, whoa, you know. It's impossible for Rosa Sharon to be that size. It's Stop impossible. The presses. Yeah. <laughs> um, but this really is a fantastic plant. And, um, you know, I'm really surprised that we it doesn't have more fans. Yeah. You know, Interesting. Yeah, it's it's one that, you know, we keep saying, like, it's such a great plant. I've seen it. If you see it in our trial gardens, you will instantly fall in love. So if you've been looking for a space-saving Rose of Sharon, if you've been looking for a plant that you don't have to work too hard and looks really great, I think that Polly Petite is a really, really excellent choice. Well, we got to get the word out, and that's what we do on the Gardening Simplified Show. And uh, if you're keeping score at home, we're talking about Rose of Sharon or Althea, or yeah. hibiscus. Stacy, I think uh, in my experience, that causes a lot of confusion. For it people. does. It definitely does. So a lot of people will, conf will, especially in the South, people will refer to Rose of Sharon as Althea. It's kind of a more old fashioned okay. term for it. But that can be confusing because there are plants with the botanical name of Althea. Mm -hmm. And there's also hollyhocks, a, a related plant with a botanical name of Elsea. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and then you have all the different types of hibiscus. Yes, so you got your tropical hibiscus, you got your perennial hibiscus. So yeah, it does get pretty. I'm confused. I'm ready to give up. Don't no, give I'm up. I'm going to give up. You can't go wrong. Honestly, you know, you can't go wrong with any of them. I do love hibiscus. I mean, everyone's heard me at this point talk so much about my, you know, summerific perennial hibiscus, but I do love the woody uh, hibiscus as well. Um, so a couple of things about them is these are full sun plants. Okay. And if you live in the South, you might be getting away with some shade and that's okay. But what you'll usually find if they're in too much shade, the classic, they get kind of, you know, a little bit more sprawling and open and they don't have that nice compact habit that you're particularly going to see with Polly Petite. The flower color is muddy. Uh, it kind of has like more some like like just muddy undertones to it. So you're not getting that like nice crisp contrast. And especially for this one, you're not going to get that nice shape. So full sun, at least six hours of sun each day is what I would recommend. Oh, and guess what? It attracts hummingbirds oh. as most hibiscus do. Fabulous. I was just going to say that what I love about them is uh, buzz pollination, the bees. We've oh, talked yeah. before about buzz pollination and Getting up close and watching that happen. I, or, or watching it not happen because they're so covered in pollen exactly. that they can't fly away. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a good, a good plant for pollinators and that kind of thing. Again, it doesn't need pruning. If you want to prune it, you would do that in early spring because it blooms on new wood. So it will create its flower buds a little bit later in the year. Overall, I have found hibiscus, including Rose of Sharon, to be pretty deer resistant. How about you? Yeah, you had same similar thing. luck? Yeah. So I have a, an old, old fashioned Rose of Sharon that was just at our house when we bought it that we still have around. And they'll nibble that like a little bit in spring, you know, when the new growth comes out. But for the most part, they're really not compromising the plant's habit. They're not compromising the blooms too much. No, I don't have a problem with it. As a matter of fact, I've always tried to encourage people to prune Althea or rows of Sharon, at least the bigger, older monsters that we have in some of our landscapes, again, because it blooms on new wood, right? I mean, right. And because if they do get too tall and you see this, uh, like on old, you know, homesteads and that kind of thing as you're driving around in the summer where they just kind of bend over because yeah. their, their uh, stems have grown so much and they, and they flop over. Mm -hmm. So a little pruning is a good thing. Now, if I do have one caveat on these, they're great for summer. They're blooming all summer long for weeks. They're one of the longest blooming, sure. you know, summer flowering shrubs. 
shrubs. Um, you might be tempted to put it by your swimming pool. But that would not necessarily be a great choice because uh, hibiscus, when their flowers fade, they kind of twist up into a little wad and they drop and they kind of leave a little bit of a mess. Mm. So that's fine. You know, I treat it like I don't clean up after them in the beds. But if you were to have like a walkway where people are often walking, um, they can get slippery when it rains. Keep (laughs) the cover on the hot tub. Right. Keep the cover on the hot tub. So not necessarily a a good choice too close to your swimming pool, but put it someplace where you can definitely enjoy it, whether that is indoors from the comfort of your air conditioning or outdoors from the comfort of your favorite lounge chair. So uh, if you want to see photos and all of the information about Poly Petite Hibiscus, this week's plant on trial, you will find it at GardeningSimplifiedOnAir.com. We're going to take a quick little break. And when we come back, guess what? We're opening up that garden mailbag. So please stay tuned. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. While we were taking a break, Adriana reminded me of a word that I have used to describe. It's not my word. It's an old-fashioned word that people use to describe the uh, spent flowers of the hibiscus, and that is mush mummy. I had never heard that before. You never heard that before? awesome because that's exactly what it is. Yeah, they're a little bit mushy, and they are kind of like a mummy, like a mummified flower. Uh, So... If you are picking them up, you don't have to. Again, they'll just decompose and, and you know, add to your soil. Um, it's a lot more fun if you're saying mush mummy. Mush mummy. You know, one time, though, my friend, Nancy Burton, who uh, takes care of containers at the uh, at beach clubs in on the New Jersey shore, was deadheading a tropical hibiscus. As that was one of the things she did. They're real popular to put in containers there. So she's taken out the mush mummies, and she goes to grab one, and it moves. It was a bat. Whoa. <laughs> it was a bat that had roosted in the hibiscus for the, night, for the day. And, uh, yeah, she screamed and, and made a little bit of a scene that, I guess, gardeners at New Jersey beach clubs are not supposed to do, but who could blame her? So, Mush mummies would be fun in October, right? They Yes. Yeah. They're a little bit dried out by then, but no, dried out. that's mush mummy season. <laughs> All right. Cool. All right. What do we got in the mailbag? All right. Let's take a look. Kate shares a photo of her container in South Georgia, USDA Zone 9B with some Fabulous dichondra, one of the best spillers for sunny garden. Yeah, so uh, Kate was nice enough to send in a photo, and she said she's very proud of her container. And um, it has a beautiful Silver Falls dichondra. So you know this plant. Silver Falls is fabulous. And, you know, people often do wonder, like, what's the best spiller for a sunny container? And um, in Kate's container, even though, like, a lot of her other, and we'll put the picture on our show notes, of course, at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Um, but you, you know, you'll see her other plants in the container haven't quite gotten established, but the dichondra is just trailing all the way down to the ground. And I love it. It just has soft little leaves, almost like a ginkgo leaf. Mm. They have almost like a ginkgo leaf type texture. They're smaller. Um, and it's so vigorous and I love that color. It goes with just about any flower color. It so. does. And silver foliage, we've talked about this before, has a tendency to be drought tolerant, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. and silver falls is both heat and drought tolerant, uh, probably an important thing in South Georgia. Yes, definitely. So if you want to see a picture of Kate's container, visit gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. So what are gardeners asking, Rick? Uh, Beth asks, watched uh, your butterfly show and want to grow more Asclepius butterfly weed, but no success. They die out. Beth, you're asking in the right place because... Stacy is an Asclepius butterfly weed enthusiast. I am, and I have an awful lot of them. Now, I will say that um, in my garden, I mostly take a pretty, uh, I guess you would describe it as a laissez-faire approach. Mm. So I've purchased um, larger plants. So like of our swamp milkweed, Asclepius incarnata, the orange uh, native one, tuberosa, the yellow one. Um, I buy those and then I just let them do their thing. Like they set seed and I let their seed just pop up. And if it's coming up somewhere where I don't want them, uh, then I'll just rip them out. So, uh, you know, Asclepius can be a little bit difficult to source because they, as they have a long taproot. Mm. 
And a lot of perennials and shrubs and trees for that matter that have a long tap root don't really do well in a conventional growing system, like in a little, you know, gallon sure. pot. So a lot of people do try to grow them from seed. But I think it's worth trying in earlier in earlier in the season to get the Asclepius plants and then let them self sow. Um, I have had luck growing them from seed, but ultimately, I think best question, it depends on which one you're growing. Some of them are going to be a lot easier than others. Okay. The common milkweed, Asclepius syriacus, I think that there is, it, it grows everywhere. <laughs> Whether or not you want it, you probably right. have it. But so I don't know if you're trying to grow something that's a little bit different. I know the tropical, maybe you're accidentally purchasing the tropical one. Asclepius curasavica, because sometimes those are sold, you know, they're sold as butterfly weed. They're not hardy. So in that case, they would be, you know, dying out for you every season because they're actually a tropical plant and they attract a ton of butterflies, but they don't last. So I think the question is, which one are you trying to grow? And, uh, you know, if you can get a plant, get it established in your garden and then let it go to seed. And then as those seeds float around and find a home, if they kind of determine for themselves where they'll grow and sure. be successful. Sure. So yeah, that's the approach that's, I take. That's good advice. And, uh, boy, you know, I mentioned the quote of Winston Churchill earlier in the show. I also love Stacy Hervella quotes, laissez faire. It's as <laughs> easy as falling off a log. Yeah. Right? <laughs> kind of, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I love my self sewers. I think we should do a show on self sewing plants one great. day. That'd be great. Uh, Kathy's writing to us. I'm considering buying hosta liners from a nursery in Georgia, seeing how I do, how do I grow them myself? I live in the suburbs of Chicago zone five. If I planted the hosta liners in pots until they got a little bit bigger, put the pots in the garage over winter for them to survive question mark. Kathy writes to us, do I still cut down the leaves in the fall? I have two bigger dogs, so don't want to plant them in the ground until they can hold their own hosta la vista baby <laughs> well you know hosta liners a liner is just a baby plant that a grower starts with sometimes they're called plugs it can be called all different things it's just a tiny little plant that a grower starts with of course mm -hmm. to grow it on and so when you're purchasing a one or three gallon hosta from a garden center it started its life as a liner they're not usually available to you know home gardeners because they do need a little bit of you know tlc and time but if you can get them by all means i would say potting them up into a container and uh, you know probably going into like a one gallon depending mm -hmm. on the variety if you're going to grow a really large one maybe you want to go into a bigger one but i think putting a hosta liner into a one gallon growing it through this year it should be absolutely fine. And I would think so too. I don't even think you'd really need to worry about sheltering it indoors. Uh, you know, we you might want to gather up all your one gallon hostas and kind of put them together in a corner or some kind of semi protected area. Uh, make sure that they can get water, mm -hmm. you know, through the winter. They're not covered by like an overhang or something like that. Um, they are actually one of the easier perennials to grow and produce. So I think that uh, it would be a great experiment and a great way to be successful. Yeah, I would agree. Provided the pots have drainage holes, oh, yes, very important. Uh, sink them, you could sink them in the ground for over winter and they should do, uh, they should do all right for it. You. you know, anyone who's ever looked at hosta roots, you, you realize looking at the roots, how tough that plant is. Yeah, they are so thick and fleshy and extensive. Uh, that's one of the reasons that they can grow, you know, so robustly. Nikki writes to us, my question is regard, in regards to my bloody cranes bill. I transplanted it back in May. It's struggled since then. I've noticed brown, black, and red spots, but a different red that it turns in the fall, it seems. Is it super stressed from the transplant? Is it a disease? If it's diseased, do you have a recommendation on treatment? I'm in zone 8A. So, you know, Nikki's question uh, made me realize that we have not really given a lot of credence to the hardworking perennial geranium. And it is tough. They are very tough and plants. And relatively easy to grow. Yeah, they're quite easy to grow. I, you know, I love them. Um, I, my mother-in-law had a little area in the front of their house, kind of like a little courtyard, um, that it was impossible for, to get anything to grow because it was really dry shade. Yes, sometimes the irrigation reached up there, but she tried hostas and all these different things and was never happy. And then um, one day I brought her uh, Biocovo perennial geranium. It's a nice pink color. And that thing has just absolutely thrived there. Mm. It looks beautiful. It's covered in flowers. And so it's just a great problem-solving plant. And it does divide 
very well Absolutely. when you have an established plant. So Nikki, I think that, um, you know, it's when most of the foliar, they can get some foliar diseases, but it's really not a detriment to them. You know, they, they can get a little spotty looking sometimes, but it's not like it's going to harm the plant. And it's important when it comes to foliar diseases that, that like leaf spot diseases are not in the plant. They're on the plant. So if you have leaf spot, it's not like, oh, your plant is permanently infected and is going to have it forever. Right. It literally is just living on that leaf surface. So if it's deciduous, like a hardy geranium is, then, you know, that foliage is going to die back. And as that goes away, the leaf spot disease goes away. So some years are bad, depending on the spring. Mm -hmm. If it's rainy, if it's cool, if it's humid, if there's low air circulation. And then they're more likely to get that leaf spot. And I think that by dividing it, yeah, that is a little bit stressful on the plant. Not to say they won't recover, but certainly would make it more susceptible as they're recovering from that transplanting, especially with a perennial geranium. I've often found that perennials that make those like thick stems, like also yarrow is another one. Mm -hmm. When you divide it, it's it gets a little funky for the, the next season or two. Yeah. Um, so I think Nikki, Nikki sent pictures and of course we'll post those in the show notes at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. I really don't it's, think you have anything to worry about. I agree. Just, it's tough. I, I have three words for Nikki. Well, drained soil. Yeah. My opinion. That, and that's I think if you pay attention to that, you're going to be just fine. Yep. So give them some, you know, keep the TLC up, give them some time to grow in and recover from the transplanting and dividing. And, uh, you know, next season they'll probably, you probably won't even remember that you divided them because they'll look so fabulous. So if you have a question for us, you can reach us at help at gardening simplified on air.com or just visit gardening simplified on air.com where you will find the photos we've referenced plants on trial, links to break branching news, all of that good stuff, as well as a contact form to send in your questions. And speaking of branching news, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, Rick's going to update us on what's happening out there in the world. It's time for branching news here on the Gardening Simplified Show. And boy, I wanted to let you know I've got some personal branching news, and that is my cannas are finally blooming. Yay! Long live the canna king. <laughs> that is, that's how you know it's the height of summer. Exactly. When the cannas are blooming and they're all lush and full and the hummingbirds are going crazy. I love that. Next come the hummingbirds. <laughs> exactly. So on branching news this week, there are still snow piles at the Minneapolis airport in July. Oof. Woo. It's probably not a terrible surprise to anyone familiar with Minnesota winters, but wow, we're well into summer. Now, of course, these snow piles are primarily sand and debris and that sort of thing, but there's still a snow pile. So that's quite amazing to have snow piles, especially when we're hearing all this news of it being the hottest week on record on the planet, right? right yeah. Unbelievable. So in, they might not be around for too much longer. At the Minneapolis <laughs> airport, snow, it's a terminal problem. Did you get that one? I, I definitely, yes. There it was in plain sight. <laughs> Okay. I'm really trying to think of a comeback here, but I, <laughs> I'm drawing a blank. It's like Christmas <laughs> in July. All right. Uh, this was interesting in the news. A bear is suspected of stealing a backpack with a phone, jerky, bird seed, and a Heineken beer from a mobile home park in Lehigh, Pennsylvania. Uh, police have been uh, tracking and found the bag later. Actually, it was a farmer in a field who found the backpack. Uh, the backpack and the phone were recovered. The bear had no interest in the phone. Of course, wanted the jerky and the bird seed. And police are just hoping the bear is over 21 as it relates to the Heineken uh, beer. I like the implication that if it, had, if it had been any other type of beer, things might have been different. That it was specifically the Heineken, you know, that it's like, oh, hey, if it was one of those like IPAs, that's exactly. too happy for the bear. You're not going <laughs> to not going to go in for that. That's great. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. And and the fact he left the phone and the back, I, you know, I just got back from Cape Cod. I was walking along the dock and there's a uh, professor from Cornell University. His name is Daniel Schwartz. And we just struck up a, a conversation. Great guy. The point I'm getting to here is he said that in New York, where he's at, they have this phrase they use all the time, leave something on the table for Murphy. Oh. I thought that was great. Leave some, So, you know, the bear left something. Okay. He didn't take it all. He left something on the table 
or Murphy? I'm sure if he could have eaten the phone, he would have. <laughs> <laughs> just, just guessing. You know, he might have given it a little, and then it didn't work out so well. I'm but. surprised he just didn't try to download a nap. How do plant reversions take place? Remember that many ornamental cultivars begin when an alert plant enthusiast notice a tree or a part of a tree with a unique growing characteristic, and sometimes they revert. I just wanted to get a, a comment from you here, Stacy, on that, because uh, I was out and about the other day, and I took a picture of a dwarf Alberta spruce that was going through uh, a reversion, reverting back uh, to its... I don't know. What do we call it? Original species? Yep. Original so a, cultivar? Yep, whatever. A white spruce original form, I yep. guess you would say. Yeah. And that is one of the wildest reversions that you will see. Yeah, <laughs> so, it is. So if you're not familiar with dwarf Alberta spruce by name, you have certainly seen one. It's that uh, little conical kind of starbursty looking evergreen that everyone seems to plant next to their front door. Mm -hmm. And... The dwarf, a little bit of a misnomer, because sure, it's dwarf when you buy it, but they do get quite large, and there's really no way to prune them or anything like that to manage their size because they are, they have such a tight conical shape. And I think this propensity to reversion has really increased over the last couple of years. I know, I mean, before I never saw, I rarely saw it, and now I feel like, you know, one in five or ten uh, really? Albertas that I see have a reversion. So wow. if, if you're thinking of the Alberta spruce, basically what happens is, you know, one day you go out and it's like a whole spruce tree is just yeah. shooting up a out Christmas the back tree. of it. A Christmas tree. Yeah. yeah. So full size, even though dwarf Alberta is very tight and compact, it just gets this whole full size shoot of a tree. And, and you sent a picture. Mm -hmm. So we'll put that in the show notes so yeah. you can see it. And uh, maybe once you see, it's one of those things that like, once you see it, you start to see it everywhere, mm -hmm. you know, that yeah, kind of thing. Because a lot of people, I think, would just assume it's like a seedling or something that popped mm -hmm. up from the ground under the plant. But no, it is the plant reverting back to its original form um, because, you know, dwarf Alberta spruce originated as like a little branch mutation on that full spruce. So some things are more prone to reversion. And we talked about this a little bit when Megan um, Matai, right. our plant breeder, was right. on. Uh, you know, sometimes variegation is another plant that often reverts. Yep. Um, and sometimes you'll see that, well, certainly with uh, things that are grafted, that the understock, it's a little bit of a different type of reversion, but that will kind of come out. So um, it's always interesting to see. And some people will think, oh my gosh, it's a miracle. Well, no, unfortunately it's not a miracle. And in most cases, you should cut the reversion out as soon as possible because usually the reversion is a much stronger plant and will quickly destroy whatever that feature was that you bought that plant for, whether it was sure. the habit, texture, color, etc. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. A long time landscape staple, use Y-E-W-S or Taxus, T-A-X-U-S, uh, are outlawed in various parts of Idaho in the past few years. Uh, because animals, after nibbling on the plants, have died, and a three-year-old uh, Boise girl was hospitalized after eating a berry from a yew plant in her family's yard. Now, this plant has just been a staple in the garden center and nursery industry for years, so it was interesting to see that in this area they're saying, no, nope, not going to plant them anymore. It is, and, you know, I... Yews are okay. Yeah. <laughs> they're extremely Industrial. they're extremely shade tolerant, and yeah. that I think is the the main reason that they have become as popular as they are. Now, I grew up in a house in suburban Detroit with yews right outside the front door, and I remember from when I was a very young age, my mom saying, "Never, ever, ever exactly. eat anything from that plant. Yep. Those red berries, they look good, but do not eat anything from that plant." And I remember her, you know, basically making me so afraid of them that if I walked out the front door, I would kind of do like a little like curve around it, so I didn't even touch the thing. You know what I mean? Um, but they are they are so toxic, and um, but weirdly, deer eat them. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. I know that they're a problem for a lot of livestock, yep. other ruminants, yep. but it's, it's just, it baffles me that a plant that is so toxic to humans and to most other animals, um, the deer just, ah, they don't just nibble it. They devour it. Oh, I mean, yeah. They will destroy it. And it is a slow growing plant. Mm -hmm. So their chance of recovery from severe deer browsing is 
slim to none, basically. Mm -hmm. But yeah. uh, it's an interesting plant. And, you know, I think that people in the UK have a much bigger reverence for taxis than we have here. Um, because I don't know if you've ever looked up like the old, I mean, they have taxis in the UK that are literally thousands of years old and they're in these, you know, beautiful old churchyards and they take on these just amazing shapes where here mm -hmm. in the U S they're a little bit like, you know, Oh, I planted them in my front yard and pruned it into a tuna can and isn't Correct. it beautiful? And you're a little like less than inspired. It is that plan that plant that we prune into meatballs and tuna cans uh, in our yards. And for people keeping at score, uh, score at home, use Y-E-W-S or Taxus, T-A-X-U-S. I always remembered the berry thing because I made the analogy death and taxes. Ah, yes. So stay away from uh, <laughs> evade your taxes is what yes, you need I to do. I definitely grew up evading taxes. And uh, so we'll, we're going to put the link there at Gardening Simplified on air.com. You can read about this story, this community in Idaho. And fortunately, the, uh, the three-year-old girl is uh, okay. Oh, that is good. Yeah. Uh, real quickly, if you are in Yosemite National Park, they are recommending that if you come across these stacks of rocks that people will stack up knock them over. You ever have the urge to knock them over? Well, knock them over. They want you to knock them over. People use them to, well, you know, create points of demarcation, I guess, along the trail or right. whatever. They're saying, go ahead, knock them over, rock and roll, rock on. All right. I'm all for it. So there you go. If you're going to be vacationing this summer. Always a, ple a pleasure and privilege to do this show with you, Stacey. Likewise. And a big thank you very much to our fabulous engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. And thank you to you for watching on YouTube, listening to us on the radio, and downloading the podcast wherever you download your podcast. Have yourself a great week. See you.